set piece by John Cage. Four minutes and 33 seconds. <laughs> Where the pianist sits at the piano and doesn't play anything at all. And of course you realize that even though the piano is quiet, the room is not quiet. And the whole point of the piece is to point that out, is to remind you how much ambient noise there is all around you all the time. The same principle applies to the meditation. You don't really notice so much ambient noise in your mind until you try to make it still, try to keep it quiet, be with the breath. And then you begin to realize your mind is a random thought generator. All these neurons firing and little thoughts appear here and appear there. This part of the mind that's always trying to make sense out of these things. And we've gotten pretty good at it, creating little thought worlds. So good at it that we tend to forget that we're in this process of creating all the time. We often take our thoughts for reality. There was a philosopher who wrote two books on language, and in one book he assumed that language was an adequate picture of reality, i.e. that our thoughts, if they're expressed as language, would be an adequate picture of reality. He built up a whole philosophical structure on that idea. And then years later he wrote another book in which language was totally arbitrary. It was just language games. It had no real relationship to reality at all. And of course, somebody pointed out the fact, well, wait a minute, we have thoughts about pain, we have thoughts about other things that are hard realities. And the truth about thinking is somewhere in between. It's not the case that it's a totally adequate picture of reality. Your thoughts are just kind of like cartoon pictures. This is why cartoons are so effective. They're very close to the way we actually think, but they don't give a total picture of reality. And at the same time, they're not totally arbitrary. They have to bear some resemblance to reality, or the way things are. So the question is, what do you do? How much credence do you give to these thoughts? And the best approach is to look at the thoughts in terms of what they do. What do they accomplish? What does this particular line of thinking accomplish? And some thoughts are adequate enough to be useful in some circumstances and not in others. So that gets down to the question, well, what do you want to accomplish? And this is where the Buddha's teachings come in. He said it is, a po it is possible to accomplish an end to suffering, and you want to use your thoughts toward that end. And any thinking that helps toward that end is useful thinking. Any other thinking that gets in the way of that is something you just want to learn how to put aside. He made a distinction between two types of thinking. There's the normal general term he uses for thinking, vidaka. And then there's another one, papancha, which is probably best translated as objectification. Where you start giving reality to your thoughts. When you think about things existing out there or things not existing out there or in here. and giving them reality. That's when your concepts take over. They take on a life of their own. It's not a question of how useful they are. They, they become things in and of themselves. And that kind of thinking, the Buddha says, stirs up a lot of trouble. 
In fact, it's the kind of thinking that leads to conflict, both with other people and within yourself. And in some contexts he said that all thinking is a type of objectification, but in another context he separates them out. That it is possible to think in other ways. And for the purpose of the practice, it's separating them out. It's actually a useful, useful concept, at least where we are in the practice right now. There will come a point where we want to go beyond all thinking. But for the time being we haven't reached that point yet. So what we have to do is learn how to use our thinking to undercut unskillful thinking. Use our thinking to undercut unskillful emotions that go along with our thoughts. Learning how to look at them as processes. This is what the Buddhist teachings on dependent core arising are all about. It's, it's one of those topics that tend to get very abstract and very complicated, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, you can learn how to apply it in a way that's very direct, i.e. you look at your thoughts as processes and then ask yourself, where does this process lead? What does it accomplish? And in looking at these things as processes, you do have to step back and say, how much reality is there to these things? And it's useful also often to remind yourself that there's a lot out there in reality that your thoughts don't capture. They're sketches, often very quick sketches. And it's useful to remind yourself of this fact when a, when a thought begins to take over the mind. It causes suffering, causes unskillful behavior. Because we just stamp too much reality on these things. So at that point it's useful to remind yourself that your thoughts really don't capture everything that's out there. And they're the product of this random thought generator. We're very busily stitching together something that makes sense out of these random thoughts. But to what extent is our stitching really helpful? And to what extent do we stitch together all sorts of weird stuff? This is one of the reasons why we stay with the breath, because the breath allows us to step back a little bit from the thinking process and see it just as that, as a thinking process. And it's useful in dealing not only with thoughts, but also emotions. Emotions tend to seem to have more reality. In fact, we tend to identify with them even more than just thoughts that go in and out of the mind with neutral feeling tones, the ones that really stir up a lot of greed, aversion, delusion, fear. Jealousy, grief. These thoughts seem real because they have such a lasting impact in the body. But the Buddha has you regard these as well as processes. And again, the question is where do these things lead? For most of us, we never think about them in those terms. Like with grief, we don't think of grief leading anywhere, it's just there this huge presence in our mind, or fear. But here the Buddha is pointing out that these are things that we can pursue or not pursue. There's so many things going on in the mind at any one time, so many possible emotions, that we actually have a choice in what we pursue and what we don't pursue. Sometimes he said grief is worth pursuing, and other forms of grief are not worth pursuing. To remind you that you do have an active role in the present moment in fabricating these things. And so when you find it useful to sort out your grief so you can understand it, that's actually serving a purpose. But there comes a point when it becomes just self-indulgent, and it's useful to learn how to see it that way. Again, as a process which can serve a purpose, but once it's served its purpose, you've got to get beyond it. And again, it's useful to remind yourself that the grief is not any more real than any other thought. This is where the Buddhist teachings on fabrication are useful. He says we fabricate our emotions in three ways, through physical fabrication, i.e. the breath. Verbal fabrication is the thoughts and 
evaluations we make of a particular situation, and then there's mental fabrication, which are feelings and perceptions. The feelings here are feeling tones, pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And then there are the perceptions, the labels we apply to things, the labels we apply to people. And it's these labels that tend to get objectified. We have to watch out for that. But with an emotion, it's more than just the thoughts. There's a physical side. It's very intense. All those hormones have gotten churned up. That's where the breath comes in, as a physical fabrication. You can monitor the way you're breathing, and you can have an impact on the way you're breathing. When things get really worked up in the body, you can ask yourself, to what extent is the way you breathe aggravating the problem, and to what extent could it be used to help relieve the problem? So when we're working here on the breath, coming in, going out, learning how to be sensitive to the breath energy in the different parts of the body, calming it, soothing it, combing out all of its tangles. That's a useful skill, not only while we're sitting here meditating, but when any emotion comes up. It gives you a place to stand, to look at the emotion. Okay, is this emotion you want to pursue, or is it one that you want to let go of? And if you think of the emotions as waves washing over you, the, the breath keeps you anchored in the body. So you don't get washed away. It keeps you anchored right here. And then you realize you have the choice. Do you want to go off into that emotional world, or can you have at least a foothold here in the sense of the body in the present moment? So you can watch the emotion come and go. Watch the thought come and go. Because you find that every emotion will have a thought associated with it, or a cluster of thoughts. If you have a good, solid place to stand, at least a calm place to breathe in and breathe out, you can begin to look at the perceptions. What are the perceptions that underlie that particular emotion? What are the ways of thinking and evaluating? Are they useful or are they not? What are they accomplishing? And again, if you can keep reminding yourself that even the emotion is only just a sketch of reality. helps you loosen up your attachments to the particular details that you tend to focus on. Except from one perspective they may be true, but from other perspectives they're totally irrelevant, or they're very loose sketches of what's going on. So if there's a particular detail that really aggravates the emotion, you can put a question mark next to it. Is this helpful? Is this not? Is this worth pursuing, or is this not? And when you can learn how to look at these things as processes and as fabrications, they're not necessarily more real or less real than anything else. So the question is, are they more or less worth pursuing? That's the real question. This pulls you out of the objectification and into just the process, the arising and passing away of thoughts. Because that's what dependent core rising is all about, is seeing things as processes and events to pull you out of the categories of objectification. And to remind you that all thinking is very artificial. All your emotions are artificial. We, some of us don't like to hear that. It's okay that our thoughts might be artificial, but our emotions have to be real. Because if we didn't have the reality of our emotions, who would we be and where would we be? And the Buddha's answer is that you might be in a much better place if you don't keep giving reality to them. Because if you loosen up your grip around your idea that these things have to be real, It offers a lot of opportunity for the mind to be a lot more free. It doesn't have to suffer from these things. For the Buddha, this is what thinking is all about. This is what useful thinking accomplishes. It helps to free you from the, the tyranny 
or the mind's insistence, well, this has to be true and that has to be real, and I'm trapped by this obstacle and trapped by that obstacle. And even though the, the pain that comes through these things is a reality, it doesn't have to be there all the time. You are actively creating that particular reality. And when you see that it is a creation and that it's not necessary, that's when you can begin to let go. So it's not totally a dream world that we're in, and it's not totally a language game. There's that story of the the article that appeared in a postmodern journal one time, written with all the, the appropriate postmodern vocabulary, talking about gravity as a social construct. And the editors were fooled. They thought this was a serious article, and they printed it. Then the author told them, wait a minute, if you think gravity is a social construct, go, go get to the edge of a balcony and jump off. The editors were not amused. <laughs> which tells you a lot about postmodern journals. So there is some reality to our thoughts, but remember, it's not, not every thought is about the law of gravity. Not every emotion is about the law of gravity. A lot of things are particular details that we've latched onto and we've stitched them together in a kind of connect-the-dots kind of way. And we forget where the dots were, and we tend to pay more attention to the lines or the threads that we use to connect things. But as the Buddha said, it's the seamstress here is craving. And how much can you trust your craving? If it's blind craving, then the seamstress just sews whatever together. You get all kinds of weird costumes. But you can educate your craving, the craving to be free. And part of the education is realizing that there's a lot in your thinking that's pretty arbitrary. It's one picture of reality, but there are many different ways that you could picture reality that would be a lot more useful. And that's the best judge of thinking is, where does it lead? What kind of thinking is helpful? What kind of thinking is harmful? What kind of thinking creates more suffering and stress, and what kind of thinking relieves suffering and stress? Totally. And so when you pose those questions and look at the, your thoughts and emotions as processes, as fabrications, creations, that right there is a type of thinking that leads in the right direction. And focus here on the breath puts us in a position where we can see things from that perspective. So even there are, there are some constraints on what we could possibly think and possibly do at any one time. Those constraints don't prevent us from doing what's skillful. So always try to look for that. What's the skillful way of dealing with this? As a particular thought, a particular emotion comes up, is this worth pursuing or is this worth undercutting? And when you can see it as a process, you not only can see the question of pose that question, but you can also give the right answer and you can follow up on that answer. You can actually do the pursuing or do the undercutting, whatever is called for. And there's a lot of freedom right there. It's in realizing that we have freedom of a choice. That's the first step on finding the ultimate freedom that can be found. As you learn to untangle all the processes that have, with which you've tangled yourself to begin with, like those wires on the headset. If you see the, the knot just as a big thing, 
it's hard to untangle it. But if you see there are threads connecting, you can pull out the threads and the problem is gone.